Cool. Thanks, everyone, for being here, and thanks for having me here. Given that we're at SciPy Japan, I probably don't have to tell you all that of the recent last few few years, we had huge advances in all sorts of different fields, thanks to machine learning, deep learning, and AI. I mean, we just heard about some of the amazing examples from science, but also many, many other fields. But what might be a bit surprising to some people is that even within the arts and even within the creative fields, deep learning and AI has had a big influence on recent developments. So today, I don't want to have a very technical talk, so I have to disappoint Eric. I'm not going to have any differential equations in my talk. Um, instead, I want to show some examples of well, cases where people have used deep learning and have used machine learning and Python for artistic and creative effects. I want to introduce some artists that are quite well established now that are using that as their main tool. And I also want to briefly talk about some project that we've been doing at our company and some of my personal projects and right towards the end kind of give maybe a little bit of an idea of what I hope the future of creativity will look like thanks to these tools. So probably the first time most people have considered the idea of creativity and AI being in some way related was when Google released those deep dream images. So essentially, if you're not familiar with them, what they're doing is reinforcing certain patterns in images. So it's almost like you're staring at a cloud and you're starting to see some patterns. And the longer you look at it, the more you convince yourself that that pattern is really there. And these networks essentially did the same. So we have these patterns of kind of eyes or random dogs popping up all over the place with slugs growing out of dogs. Um, and yeah, that was really the first case where we had this combination of deep learning and creativity. Now, Back in the days, I actually made a little bit of money on the side doing music videos for bands. And my first ever AI project was using the Deep Dream network as a visual effect on one of those videos. So the visual effect you see here is actually done by the Deep Dream network. That was back in 2016. At that time, it was kind of a cool thing to do. Now we've moved much, much beyond um, that particular, well, this kind of thing being very interesting, really. What really became quite popular over the last few years in the artistic community have been GAN's generative adversarial networks. They are really good at essentially generating realistic looking data. So I'm sure a lot of you have seen videos like this of faces morphing into each other and so on. Now this particular example is from 2017, which is really prehistoric in deep learning timescales. Uh, we've come much, much beyond this and we now have really photorealistic images. And there's a whole host of websites popping up like thispersondoesnotexist.com. Every time you refresh the page, it actually generates an image that looks really photorealistic and it's hard to tell whether it's fake or not. Um, now, this definitely poses some issues, but for an artist, it's also really interesting to work with these systems. The most famous case of what made really AI art become a well-known thing, not just within the AI community, was probably this example of Edmond de Bellamy by this French collective that calls itself obvious. Now, there's a huge debate in the art community of whether it was good or whether it was art, what they did. Um, I don't want to go into this whole debate. Feel free to read up on it. What I want to say is to me, whether it was good or not what they did, those guys aren't artists, in my opinion. Now, even people who use AI or deep learning as their main tools, those real artists, they still study it as a craft, like a traditional painter would study their paintbrush, the paint they're using, the canvases they're using. Those guys, for me, it was kind of like, Back in the days when maybe MS Paint was just released, someone could make a really shitty drawing with some circles and squares. And just because it was so novel, people might actually get excited about this. Those guys managed to auction off this print for half a million dollars. And I mean, they might be good business people. Um, they were clever at doing that and using this excitement. But yeah, they're not artists in that traditional sense to me. And even they signed this painting with one of the key equations underlying uh, the GAN algorithm. So it's almost like they're saying, we're not the artists, the AI made it. 
But what I hope to convince you here is actually that true artists will really remain artists and they will not have, well, their jobs replaced by AI. True artists will really find ways to use these tools for new ways of creative expression and actually to be more human in general. So that's what I want to show you in this talk. Here's one artist I really like who is probably the most famous and well-established AI artist, Mario Klingemann. He's got a huge portfolio, portfolio mainly using these generative adversarial networks. This series here is Neural Glitch, just one of his many, many series. And he's become extremely good at really understanding how to use these networks, how to code them, but also what data to train them on, and then also exactly how to manipulate them to get exactly the kind of artistic results that he's aiming for. He actually recently also auctioned off one of his works, an interactive installation, and he only received $50,000 for it. And afterwards, there was huge news saying, oh, okay, this AI art era is over. It was quick kind of hype, but nothing about it. But I'm actually quite happy that he only received that little. And he tweeted about it himself that he's happy with that, because now AI art has moved from this kind of quick hype and bubble thing into a more serious field. And we're now actually seeing realistic prices for these artworks. So I highly recommend checking out some of his other work. Another artist I really like is Memo Acton. He's very different from Mario Klingemann. He's more conceptual. And he's extremely good at kind of pushing those networks to their breaking point and beyond, actually, and using that breaking for artistic effect. So when you train a neural network, initially, it has no idea of the real world. It does have absolutely zero understanding. And depending on what data you show it, it might actually get a very strong bias towards that data. Now, often we deal with this bias as a big problem we're trying to avoid. But in his Learning to See series, Memo Acton was actually using exactly this bias for artistic effect. So I'll show you this video in a second. And what you see is on the right is what the network thinks it's seeing. And on the left is what Memo Acton is actually showing the network. So you see here he used a network that was only trained on, say, landscape images or images of essentially these oceans and clouds. So no matter what he shows his network, it doesn't know any better than to interpret the world in terms of oceans and clouds. Let me just go ahead a little bit. Yeah, you can choose any kind of object he wants, but the network ends up interpreting it in terms of what it knows. It's using that bias. Here he used another network that was trained on fire. And in the end, I really like this one on flowers. Now, this is nice from an artistic point of view, but it also kind of asks us the question, what kind of biases do we have, each of us? I mean, I'm not suggesting it's that strong, but we all grew up in different cultures with different backgrounds and seeing different things. So it kind of asks you how much different do we actually see the world around us from each other due to these biases we have. I don't think I have time to go into this, but Tom White is another really nice artist I recommend checking out. So let me just briefly give you a background of myself, actually. I started my academic career in quantum information theory, so quite different, actually. Um, but about three years ago, I decided to change into AI research. But initially, I was working on AI for business applications. For example, looking at text data for financial analysts to get, well, to help them do their job better and quicker and find more relevant information. But over time, I got more and more interested in the creative applications of AI. And actually, at the beginning of this year, I decided to make that my full-time job. So I joined Cosmo. We're a small company based in Nakameguro. And at the heart of the company is really the idea of computational creativity, using AI, using deep learning, but also using all sorts of other technical and digital tools for creativity. And we're working both on commercial products and commercial projects with big Japanese as well as international clients. But we're also working on purely artistic projects, installations, exhibition, and so on. If you're interested in the commercial side, feel free to talk to me later. But for now, I actually want to focus on the artistic aspect. And I want to show you two projects we've been working on. Probably the one that got us the most famous or got the most attention so far is this AI DJ project. So on the left, you see our CEO now actually performing this project. For those of you who are not too familiar with DJing, 
the concept of playing back to back means that you have two humans playing together. One person selects a track, mixes it, then the next person takes over, selects a track, mixes it, and you have this constant evolving kind of, well, interplay between those two humans. But in this project, we actually replaced one of those humans with an AI. So the human selects a track, mixes it, and then the AI selects a track and mixes it. And you really get this dialogue between AI and human. And what's interesting here is also we decided to not go with digital audio. We actually decided to go vinyl. So on the right, you actually see the learning process of this little robot arm learning to manipulate this vinyl using reinforcement learning. We're still working on developing this project further. Right now, one thing we're doing is actually having cameras look at the audience and basically studying their behavior. Are they dancing? Are they enjoying it? And then using that information to actually make better track selections. As a DJ, you want to build some kind of wave of energy. You start slow, and in the middle of your set, you want to have higher energy and then go down again. We hope that by analyzing the audience reaction, we can essentially help the AI do this just like a human DJ would. Another project we're currently very actively working on is this neural beatbox project. Here the idea is to help people without any musical background um, generate beats by themselves. So this is a very early prototype you see. The idea is you record some of your, well, record some sounds. You can make them with your mouth or you can clap or anything you want really. We're then analyzing it and slicing it into individual sounds. And the AI yeah. is then analyzing those sounds and figuring out, okay, this kind of sounds like a kick drum, this kind of sounds like a snare drum. So you see it's now doing that, and it plays it on that grid. And we can then generate rhythms using AI, and it's actually constantly evolving rhythms. So those are also on the fly generated by AI. Currently, we're working yeah. on an installation yeah. of this. So we'll yeah. be taking part in yeah. this exhibition, yeah. AI More Than Human, yeah. at the Barbican yeah. in London all summer. Yeah. If you're in London this summer, definitely yeah. check it out. Yeah. We'll have yeah. artists like Mario Klingemann yeah. will be participating, but also big yeah. music acts like yeah. Massive Attack. And our project for this will essentially be well, an evolved version of that. It will be a little booth where constantly a beat is playing and people can walk up to it and record themselves making sounds and also their video. And we will then replace individual pieces of sound and video with their contribution. So we'll be constantly, for this whole three months, it will be one big evolving interactive installation where every viewer can contribute a little sound and a little piece of video. So that's what I want to tell you about the work we're doing at Cosmos, some of the projects. There's many more, and please check out our website or talk to us. Um, one of the key groups of models that we're using for creativity falls under this category of generative models. And the key idea behind this kind of goes back to this quote by Richard Feynman, which is, what I cannot create, I do not understand. So from a researcher perspective, sort of what we're hoping to do is that if we can create models that can, well, create real data, those models must have some kind of understanding of the real world. So that's really where the artificial intelligence part comes in. Often, unfortunately, in reality, it still looks a little bit like this. So our models have an understanding of the world, but it's very, very biased and can break down very easily. Now, before I was working on business applications, and if you're working on, say, financial predictions or medical predictions, you don't want your results to look like that. But now as an artist, it's actually very exciting because now I can really look for these things and those things are, well, a good thing for me. So that's a really nice change. Now the only little technical part I want to talk about is this class of models called autoencoders or variational autoencoders. They're also generative models, just like the GANs I mentioned earlier. But I particularly like working with those. The very basic idea is that you take some data as an input and you then send it through your network and ask the network to reconstruct that data. But the key is that you introduce some information bottleneck in the middle. So if we think of an image, sure, the easiest way would just be to transmit every single pixel value. But that way, our model doesn't have to learn anything. If we introduce some kind of information bottleneck in the middle, we actually force the model to be smarter and to learn some abstractions and meaningful representations. So if we take a toy example and actually just take a two-dimensional code and the example of learning images of cats and dogs, it might actually figure out, if we're really lucky or if we force it, 
to use one dimension to say whether it's a cat or a dog, and the other where it's a, whether it's dark or light fur. So, of course, we lose a lot of information, but with just two numbers, we manage to get, well, convey some fairly useful information about those images. And more importantly, we actually forced our model to learn these abstractions in the first place. Using these techniques, we also get clusterings in this latent space that basically have similar images or similar data points in general be closer together to each other. So this allows us to do things like data comparisons and similarity of data. And also it allows us to actually interpolate between real data, like I showed you in the gun art example. So we can encode two real images, for example, the image of a man and a woman. And we can then go in between and ask the model, what would data in between there look like? And it's not like we take Photoshop and overlay these images and change the opacity of one. We actually ask the model, what would data look like that would sit in between at those points? What would that look like if it was real? And that allows for all sorts of cool creative applications. If you're not too familiar with variational autoencodes and would like to learn more, I wrote a bunch of articles about that a while ago that kind of really go into the detail and kind of look at it from a slightly different perspective that I'm very used to actually from quantum information theory, phrasing these things in terms of games. And it's really worth checking out actually just for the amazing illustrations that my friend did for those. So even if you don't enjoy the text, the illustrations are awesome. Finally, I just want to briefly show you some project I've done. Um, this one I call latent pulsations. The data here is actually text data. Each point corresponds to a financial complaint. Uh, well, complained about a financial product. So it's some one color is complaints about credit cards, another color is complaints about mortgages, and so on. And as I play this video, you'll actually see the learning process of this neural network. So initially, it has no idea. It's completely random. But as I play this, I just use some drum and bass because I could. Um, you now see kind of clusters emerging. And as the network learns to really understand these concepts that are in that text, it actually figures out these clusters and manages to pull them apart. But you also see overlapping clusters or subclusters because the network really learns to go much beyond um, purely those human defined categories. So it really gets a very fine understanding of what's contained in the text data. What I liked about this as well is the data itself is incredibly boring. It's financial complaints. But even using that data, we could get some really interesting artistic effects. Another project of mine is this latent landscapes. And often when people use generative models for creativity or art, what they care about is the actual final output, what the model generates. I wanted to flip that idea on its head a little bit and actually look at the model itself. So here what you see is essentially looking into the model and visualizing that. So for those of you who are a bit more mathematical, what I'm visualizing here is the metric on the latent space itself. So it's actually how curved is that space. And I find it really beautiful that even the models themselves have these really inherent beauty and these kind of abstract landscapes or these cloud formations. Finally, the biggest project I've been working on so far was what I call Neural Funk. I'm also a drum and bass producer in my free time, and I really like the idea of using neural networks as my only synthesizer, as my only sound source for a song. So I'm still, in the end, the one who's producing the track and the one who's composing it, but I could use neural networks as a new form of sound design. And I started out by taking my sample library, so about 60,000 uh, yeah, 60, individual sounds, and now I didn't look at the sounds themselves, but I converted them to spectrograms, which is essentially a visual representation. I should probably mention, because we're at the SciPy conference, I was using heavily Librosa. It's a wonderful library for um, all sorts of sound-related stuff. And all the deep learning you've seen has been done in TensorFlow. But yeah, I trained um, an autoencoder, a variational autoencoder, on this data, essentially fed it in and asked the model to reconstruct. Now, what you saw here, that's an example of me actually saying Neural Funk, the title of that project. And here, what you see is a reconstruction. Now, you see it loses a lot of detail. That has various reasons. One, my model was probably quite biased towards drum sounds, because that's a large portion of my sample library. But also, we naturally lose some uh, detail. But this is actually interesting, because I don't want to just get the original audio back. Then I might as well just use the original. But I can use this for sound design. Now, this sound you hear is actually what the network thinks me saying neural funk sounds like. You can hear sort of the two parts.
but I could use that as an interesting effect in the final track. And I could also just do a simple clustering of my sample library. So you can clearly see there's a big cluster of kick drums and so on. I don't have too much time to go into that. But having these networks gave me a really interesting tool for sound design. I could do various different things. The simplest thing I already showed you, which is just taking one sound, sending it through the network, and seeing how it's interpreted. Here's another example of that. That one's a, a bass sound. See, so here's this very nice subby bass, actually. And I also ended up using that. Much more interesting is this idea of data interpolation. So I can take two sounds and ask my network, what would a sound be like? That's essentially the combination of those sounds. So you see at the top, I have a kick drum. And in the middle, I have this sustained vocal note. I think it's a synthetic vocal note. It's too perfect. Um, but in the end is what my network thought the interpolation of those two things sound like. So you can already see we have this initial attack from the kick drum, but we also have a sustained note at the same fundamental frequency as this vocal note. And if I play it, you hear this initial attack from the kick drum, but then we also have the sustained part. I could also actually go beyond that and just choose a random point in my latent space that doesn't correspond to any real data and ask the network, hey, what does that sound like? In some cases, I happened to come across a sound that was actually related to something realistic, like an instrument. But in many cases, it also ended up with just completely random stuff. And again, this is actually interesting from a sound design perspective, because it gives me completely novel ways of making sounds. Here's another one. You see a lot of low frequencies, uh, not any low frequencies, but a lot of high frequencies. So we can expect it to be some kind of chirp. And that's what it is. So initially, I just generated them completely randomly. But the more I played around with it, the more I actually got some kind of feeling for how I need to push my network to get the kind of sounds I'm actually looking for. So again, studying these tools and really becoming craftsmen at it, we as artists can use these networks in very deliberate ways. Next thing I did was I essentially took a breakbeat, as we call it. So it's basically a drum solo. And imagine what would have that have sounded like if it was played by a neural network. And that's what came out. So all those sounds came out of the neural network. And in the end, I actually was submitting this to a machine learning conference as a project. So I had a very strict deadline. So I was working on it nonstop for two weeks. In the end, I was really frustrated and just thought, OK, I'm going to improvise a little bit as me playing in some improvised melody. But before I play this, keep in mind, everything you'll hear, the sounds came out of neural networks. That's the idea. And the finished project then sounded a little bit like that. So I'll just keep that playing for a little bit in the background. What I really hope I managed to show you is that AI is not really endangering our creativity or endangering kind of, we don't have to fear losing some of those things that make us human, like creativity and empathy. I actually think if we really embrace AI, it can enable us to be much more creative and actually much more human. And also take over like some of the busy work. Like We're so obsessed with busy work these days, and we don't take enough time to reflect, just to pause and to actually think, and also not enough time in solitude. But if you really embrace this, yes, there will be jobs lost, but those jobs will be busy work. So if you really allow this to happen and actually embrace it, and take more time off. I think as a society, you can really benefit from that, not just as individuals, but also companies, if we really take that into account. I'm actually so excited about this whole prospect of AI enabling us to take more time off and what it will lead to. I'm actually working on a book right now, together with a friend, about exactly this topic of time off and how many of histories and actually the present's most successful people have been that successful, not despite taking ample time off, but exactly because they embraced it. And I really hope that AI will, in the future, enable us to do more of that. So I hope I convinced you of that as well. Um, if you haven't had enough of me yet, I'm all over the internet, Medium, Instagram, Spotify, and also our book website. And also, please talk to me afterwards, or if you have any questions now. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Uh, 
Thank you, Pradita. Uh, in the beginning, you mentioned about the bias of the model. So, is there any any measure we can any any tools to measure the bias? That's a really good question, and yeah, bias is a huge problem. Um, there's always kind of two aspects to this. Like for me now as an artist, I actually find it interesting and I find it's also a chance to take it a bit to the extreme and actually highlight this bias like Memoakton did in his work and maybe make people more aware of it. Like some of the biases we have are much less obvious than that. So right now, just speaking as an artist, I just think we have a potential to highlight this and make people more aware of it. Solving the problem is gonna be much, much harder. I mean, they're very obvious biases like We've heard of gender biases, race biases, these kind of things. But I think there's also much more subtle and hidden things that we're not that aware of. And to be honest, I don't have a good solution to it, but I think it's a very, very important problem to actually look into and solve. If we don't have any other questions, we will close the talk. So please thank Max again. ありがとうございました。